Good to see you again, Michael. It's good to see you again. It has been about five years since we last spoke. You were episode 23 of the podcast. I don't even know how to react to that. Well, five years? How, yeah. We're going to talk about everything that's happened in crypto over the last five years in this episode, You right? said you got an hour hard stop. <laughs> <laughs> that was, but in those days, it was just me with a little, I don't know, do you even remember it? We did it in London. Um, I'm, been, I'm an honest guy. I don't remember it. Did you know you'd been on before? I did know I'd been on before, right, okay. but I'm impressed that it was five years ago. Wow. Yeah. It's, so you were at a conference in London. Okay. Um, and I can't remember who reached out to who. Probably me in those days. And I turned up with my little case, set up my microphones. Okay. So this is 2018, 2017? 2018. 2018. Okay. Where was the Bitcoin price? I can have a look. Lower than now. Lower than now. Yeah, lower than now. And people probably thought you were crazy and I was crazy. Yeah, they still they still think that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they still think we're all crazy. And now, since then, it's now all of this equipment. Amazing. Six, pe six people work on the show. And we're still all crazy. Congratulations. It's, uh, it's great. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been an interesting five, six years. It has. Uh, interesting. Oh, here we go. It's a reason to celebrate. Look at this. This is service. Wow. Cheers. 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 All right. Go bring him outside. We won't. Uh, you've had an interesting year. We've had a really good year. Well, <laughs> Grayscale may have had a, a good year. There is there is a question on everyone's mind. It keeps keeps coming up. It's been coming up a lot this week, right, Danny? It has. Yeah, how do we how do we say your surname? Why don't you try and then I'll correct you. So, so I've been saying Sonnenshine, and then so, what else have we had? It's a different pronunciation on the O sound, is what Sonnesh I've heard. Sonnenshine. We can't get it right. It's actually a lot simpler than it looks. Okay. Sun and shine. Sun and shine. Sun and shine. That's a that's a beautiful name, really. Well, thank you very much. You bringing the sunshine for us? Um, always sign, you know, shining the sun on the crypto markets. How's that? All right. So, uh, are you here for an interview or is this a PR tour? I think we're here for an interview. Isn't that what you asked for? You asked actually, do you want something funny? Danny, Danny, Danny's the producer. He runs the show. Yeah. How, when was it? Like four weeks ago, you messaged me. He's like, Something like that. He's like, you know, I think we should try and get Michael back on the show. I was like, he's not going to come on the show. There's zero chance he's going to come on your show. Then was it you who reached out to me or? It could, it could have, it could have been one of our agency partners. Yeah. yeah, and they reached out and said, "Do you want Michael on the show?" And we're like, "Yeah, absolutely." I just assume you wouldn't want to. I didn't think you would be doing interviews at the moment. I, I'm doing a ton of interviews at the moment, and thrilled to be here. Let, right. Let's, let's get into it. You have a long list of things to ask me about. It looks like. Well, let's 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 see uh, how rehearsed some of your answers might be. No, look, listen. <laughs> look, there's a lot. There's a lot been going on. My uh, primary concern is uh, Gemini is a sponsor. And so obviously, and I know they're a separate company, Genesis, but Genesis, DCG, Grayscale, same group. A lot of my listeners have been caught up in Gemini. So I've got some interest in some of that area, but we also, I've got an interest in the SEC stuff. I really want to know what's going on with that. Sure. Uh, we, we need an ETF. We should have an ETF. There's a yep. whole bunch of stuff. But I think, let's start with Grayscale. And just help people understand what the Grayscale Trust is. What is it? Explain it. Yeah, sure. So I can't even imagine what Grayscale uh, was five years ago when we last had a conversation like this. Um, what I'll tell you is where Grayscale has gotten to today. We are the world's largest digital currency asset manager. Uh, we manage probably about $20, 21000000000 billion of assets under management. Uh, how, how much of that is Bitcoin and how much is the, uh, the shit coins? That's your words, not mine. Uh, there are no shit coins um, in, in the Grayscale family of products. So no, we have um, 17 uh, digital asset products. Um, and so yeah, a dominant amount of the, of the assets we manage are in our Bitcoin and our Ethereum products. Um, but it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison, right? Each of these products started at a different point in time. They've had different amounts of um, you know, investor interest, different market cycles that they were launched into, et cetera. But, but really, people who are engaging with Grayscale 
are wanting crypto exposure, don't necessarily know how to buy crypto directly, don't want to buy crypto directly. How do we transfer it? How do you store it? How do you safe keep it? And instead, they can use an investment vehicle um, that fits into their brokerage account, their retirement account. Um, and so we have individual investors, institutional investors, Grayscale products are owned inside of mutual funds, inside of ETFs, you name it. And um, I'm sure what we'll spend a lot of time talking about today is our flagship product, our longest running product, which is the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, uh, ticker symbol GBTC, which is the world's largest Bitcoin fund. Uh, it owns over 3% of all the Bitcoin outstanding in the fund itself. Yes, we will. I'm, I don't care about the other funds. I mean, the ETH one and the uh, Ethereum Classic one and... Or the I don't care. This is a Bitcoin show, so we'll I, care. We'll I care know where it. I am. You know where you are. You but, know your home. But but Grayscale does offer a very wide array of investment products because there are new and developing use cases in crypto beyond just Bitcoin. Um, although Bitcoin is you know certainly where we've seen the most demand in our product family. We keep away from the shit coins. Okay, all right, as you wish. Ticker S H I T. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I think the Bitcoin, I think it's super interesting when you guys launched it because it, it was that opportunity for people who wanted exposure, didn't want to buy it. Like, I, it's a great product. September 2013. Very successful product. That's when we launched the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, September 2013. Was that, what was the Bitcoin price then? That was after, that was after Mt. Gox. Um, no, Mt. Gox. Oh, Mt. Gox was 14, was it? Mt. Gox was already up and running. I think the the fact that back then Mt. Gox was one of the only places yeah. you could actually buy some Bitcoin was a really compelling reason to start an investment vehicle that would allow people to buy Bitcoin exposure. You know, going through the hoops of getting money to Mt. Gox, buying Bitcoin, getting it off Mt. Gox. I mean... That was a lot to do and obviously was not successful for a lot of people. So that was some of the actual impetus for even launching Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Were you, were you at Grayscale from the start? I missed it by, call it four months. Was that like, were you, because you worked at Second Market. So I did work at Second Market, yeah. right? So I started at Second Market working for Barry Silbert, our yeah. founder. And when I joined um, the division of Second Market that was focused on Bitcoin, um, I was the fifth employee. Uh, what became Grayscale and what obviously became the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust had about $60 million of assets under management. And I joined to lead the sales effort. Um, and so I've been with the business almost since day one. Um, those first four employees are no longer with the firm. Uh, so I consider myself then to be kind of employee number one. Wow. Um, and today we are about 60 employees and again, uh, about 20, 21 billion dollars in assets under management. That's a good number. It is. And I was fortunate enough to be given the reins to take over as CEO about yeah. two years ago. Because you were managing director when we first. I think I was. Uh, what was the different role from managing director to CEO? What, like different role for you? Well, I think for me, you know, starting out in sales, um, I spent the first of my many years at Grayscale really focused on building relationships, running around the world. I can't tell you how many people thought I had three heads when I was talking about Bitcoin changing the world or about the use cases that we saw for Bitcoin emerging. Uh, and I think over time, as I progressed through the firm, I took on a more business development kind of a role, ultimately took on a leadership role as I became managing director. And, you know, today, I think as CEO, what's been so exciting about it is really continuing to focus these last two years under my leadership on those kind of foundational elements that maybe Grayscale didn't have that I think have been really important as a springboard to the rest of Grayscale's growth, its next chapter. So we focused on our own broker dealer, our own registered investment advisor. I've built out my leadership team. We've built out governance. We've built out processes and procedures. It's um, It's been really exciting to kind of put all of that foundational work into the company. Um, and although we're talking now amidst what's my third crypto winter, actually. Um, there's no question that all the work we've been doing as a team is really positioning ourselves for that next phase of growth as we come out of this crypto winter. I think, though, once a salesman, always a salesman. I'm a salesman. I started out my career as a salesman in advertising. Interesting. And yeah, I, so I my first agency job was 
for a small uh, advertising agency in Bedford, where I'm from, called Evolving Media. I was uh, I was essentially commercial director at like 27, just because it's a small company. And and even though uh, I went on to run that business at my own one, I think when you run a company, you're still a salesman. I was still always a sales. I'm a salesman doing this job. You know, I have to sell sponsorships and totally. But but I don't. So what's the sales role within something like Grace Girl? Is it is it the the fact is like the revenue model is quite simple. It's a percentage of the nav, and so your job is to sell as many shares as possible. Correct. As a salesperson at Grayscale, you're responsible for looking for new relationships, looking for you know deepening relationships with existing investors, and actually a really important role, which is to bring data and intelligence back to the rest of the team as to what are investors saying? Where are their interests? What are they confused about? What are they excited about? Because um, I think for us, we've really prided ourselves on you know being great at building products that investors want. Um, it may not be exciting to you, but you know we're a firm that was you know in the metaverse probably about two plus years before the metaverse became like a colloquial term, right? So I think for us, we're always trying to be on the cutting edge of where investors' act, you know appetite and activity may be going in kind of the months and years to come. Okay, so if there's a sales role, is there, are there limitations to who you can sell to? There, is that regulated? It is. So the Grayscale products are sold typically as private placements. So we're only selling to accredited investors, high net worth individuals, family offices, hedge funds, pensions, endowments, you name it. Um, we have since you know, eventually gotten into offering um, equity ETFs as well that obviously have a much broader um, audience of investors that can access them. But typically for our digital asset products, really looking at the accredited investor segment. But you can, can you sell it internationally? We do have investors that that are um, able to come to Grayscale from overseas. That's usually done on an unsolicited basis, where investors who may be in the UK or in France or you know you name it um, may be coming to invest in Grayscale, you know, from overseas on their own. Could, so could I could I do that? Could I come to you guys if you were an accredited investor? Sure. How, how do I? So is it an accredited investor by the rule, U.S. rules? Correct. Because it's a. It's a good buy price at the moment. It's a discount on Bitcoin. <laughs> if you're successful in your lawsuit with the SEC, well, let's let's talk about that. So, what you're talking about? Sorry, it, I, sorry yeah, 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 I do. Just one more question on that. Just I'm trying to understand the whole thing. But so, if you're if you're selling, you're finding new customers. There's both the sales, but is there an account management? role as well that you're keeping customers happy because you want to keep them buying. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have a pretty extensive investor solutions team. These are folks that are giving periodic updates to investors, helping to, you know, push through a lot of the research and content the Grayscale team is creating. We host webinars. Um, you know, I think it's really trying to find out the right touch points to keep investors engaged with the asset class as a whole. We've um we've we've taken on our first salesman for the podcast now. Okay, Austin Green, who was previously at Blockworks. How's he doing? He's doing great. He's, I mean, it's two weeks in. He's just embedding himself. Okay, in okay. And, so it's a little early to start judging his, yeah. his performance. Well, no, but he's been great. He's got some great ideas. Um, but I'm in that process now of handing over some of the relationships because I just don't have the time for it anymore. But there is a thing where certain people still want a, a relationship with me or know I'm still involved. Do you still have that? You know, there's an article that you should read after we sit down and do this, and yeah. it's this concept of giving away your Legos, right? You remember yeah. the kids' toy Legos yeah. that you build stuff with? Well, as you progress through an organization, as you grow in your responsibilities, the idea is that you can only individually grow if you give away your Legos. So the things that you used to play with, the toys that you used to hold tightly, the things you didn't want to share – you can only really grow and progress if you hand those off to somebody else. Um, and so that is certainly something that I had to learn as I came up the ranks through Grayscale. Um, and yes, there are of course some clients who would of course rather speak to me because of our relationship, because of our history. But over time, um, I've given away my Legos. I've given Danny most of my Legos, in fairness. <laughs> I've handed a few off to Ben. <laughs> you, you have, yeah. So, so, so you have no customer contact at all now? No, no, no. I'm not saying that at all. There are all right. definitely investors who do speak with me quite often, who I want to speak to quite often. Um, it really just depends on the relationship. Hmm. Because it's going to be interesting to invest if you are successful with the SEC. I'm tempted. I've, I've got to say, I've been very tempted when the you know with such a high discount. It's buying almost half price Bitcoin at one point. Where's the discount now? 
It's about 45%-ish. Yeah. Hmm. Well, can I dive into that? Yeah, let's dive into that. Because people need to understand what you're talking okay, about. Okay, well, explain what an ETF is so people understand and why an ETF is different from uh, a, a trust. So, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust from day one, even before we had our very first investor, before we even took on our first Bitcoin, we always knew it was going to become an ETF. We purposely chose a legal structure that a lot of ETFs have today. So it's a Delaware grantor trust. Now, investors in the US, in the UK, all over the world, they use ETFs all the time. ETFs often are instruments that investors can buy in their brokerage account, their retirement account, you name it. And it's offering exposure to something. So a lot of investors who want to invest in gold, well, they can buy gold directly, call a gold broker, figure out where to buy it. Or they can go in their brokerage account and buy shares of a gold ETF, where they're buying shares of a security. And the value of that security is based on the value of the gold that's tied to it. The same is true if an investor wants to get access to oil or an investor wants to get exposed to all 500 stocks in the S&P 500. They don't have to go buy all 500 stocks. They can just buy an ETF and the shares give them the value of all 500 stocks in the S&P 500. In the case of Grayscale, here in the US, regulators have not allowed for Bitcoin ETFs that hold Bitcoin to come into the market. And so we have been on a path really since day one to make sure that we were not only launching a Bitcoin investment vehicle, but one that would eventually become an ETF. So the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is a series of shares that investors own. And each of those shares is fully backed by Bitcoin. There's no cash, there's no leverage, there's no trading. If you own a share of Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, you're owning a piece of Bitcoin underlying that share. Now, what we did was pretty interesting and I think pretty innovative along the way where even though you bought into the trust as a private placement, as an accredited investor, starting in 2015, we actually created a secondary market for the shares. And that's when Grayscale Bitcoin Trust got a ticker symbol. Ticker is GBTC. And so anybody, you didn't need to be accredited anymore, who wanted to get exposure to Bitcoin could start buying and selling shares of GBTC on the secondary market. And GBTC has been wildly successful. People from all over the world, not just the US, who have access to the US securities market can buy and sell shares of GBTC throughout the trading day at you know, whatever the price is dictated by the market. What we've seen in GBTC though, is that the value of the shares sometimes has gone and been more valuable than the Bitcoin it owns. And sometimes like today, it's dipped below the value of the Bitcoin that it owns because it is not an ETF. An ETF has an embedded mechanism that no matter what is going on in the market, no matter how many investors may be buying, no matter how many investors may be selling, there's always a mechanism that allows market participants to ensure that those shares go right back in line with the underlying asset it holds. It could be S&P 500, it could be gold, it could be oil, or it could be Bitcoin. And so today, what is that mechanism? Is it because of redemptions? It's arbitrage mechanism. Yeah. So you have market participants that can create more shares of the ETF or redeem or reduce the number of shares of the ETF in the market so that the supply demand dynamics of how many shares in the market always get the share price back to its net asset value, back to the fair value of what it owns. And so because GBTC is not an ETF today, Sometimes, again, it goes to a premium. Sometimes it goes to a discount. And so to the point you were making today, GBTC trades at about a 45% discount to its net asset value. So to certain investors, they may say to themselves, well, I could put a dollar into Bitcoin and I'll get a dollar's worth of Bitcoin. Or I could put a dollar into GBTC and actually control more Bitcoin because I'm buying it at 65 cents on the dollar. Right. And that's a trade that some investors may find attractive depending on their time horizon. Now, we can get into the next phase of this, although, or you might have a question, but we're still on a path to convert GBTC into an ETF. Right. That, yeah. That's that's where we find ourselves today. My, my, my only question on that is do you guys benefit from either a premium or discount? Or does it make no difference? We, we as an organization, 
I would say that we are frustrated to see the shares trading at a discount, much the same way our investors are. We'd, of course, like to see the shares trading at a, you know, at NAV or even at a premium to the net asset value. But ultimately, we view where we are today as a stepping stone to that, you know, kind of ultimate goal we've always had, which is an ETF. Uh, Companies like BlockFi were trading the premium. It was well known they were trading the premium. How did you guys feel about that? Are you ambivalent to that? Or you know, do you look at something like that and you see it's risky? Well, so what you're referring to is there was a time period where yeah. today GBTC is at a discount. There was also a time period where GBTC was trading at a premium. And so for certain investors, they could have invested at the net asset value and actually monetized their investment at a premium and actually made a return higher than if they had just bought Bitcoin outright. And we viewed that as something that was a market dislocation, right? And again, still in this same time period um, where GBTC is still not yet an ETF and thus the premiums and discount are going to be there because that mechanism is not embedded in the product. Right, okay. So onto the lawsuit. Uh, Gary Gensler isn't the most popular person amongst Bitcoiners. He seems to be holding this up. I think someone like Hester Pierce is probably, Hester Pierce, sorry, is probably a bit more pro- um, the ETF happening, she certainly, certainly seems to be more on the side of the Bitcoiners within the SEC. Uh, I didn't even know you could sue the SEC, by the way. just You can. Yeah. They get sued all the time. It's just not always spoken about. Yeah. And so, I mean, we don't need the full details of the lawsuit, but just like, what is the top line? What is it you're suing them for? How long do you think this will take? So... Here in the U.S., when you want to bring an ETF to market, you need to file an application with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And there are sometimes, uh, broadly speaking, two paths. Either there is already a, you know, viable path because there's existing rules that your ETF can fit into, and thus there's nothing preventing it from coming to market. Or in certain instances, the product, the structure or the exposure it offers doesn't fit into existing listing standards. And thus the SEC needs to review the application and they can ultimately approve it or deny it. What we've seen in the US has historically been no Bitcoin ETFs on the market. And there would really be two categories of ETFs coming to the market for Bitcoin. Bitcoin ETFs that hold Bitcoin itself, spot Bitcoin, like the way GBTC owns spot Bitcoin, or ETFs coming into the market that may own a Bitcoin futures contract, right? We know that there's a rapid, you know, developing derivatives market, CME Bitcoin futures. And so the SEC's attitude had been no Bitcoin ETFs. And then in 2021, they allowed the first Bitcoin futures ETF into the market. Huge stepping stone for Bitcoin, huge for the asset class, huge for the investor community. Why futures are not a spot? You should have someone from the SEC on and ask them that question. Which is a better product for the cons- for the customer? So it's a subjective view, mm-hmm. but certainly a spot Bitcoin ETF would be better. It just tracks the price of Bitcoin. A Bitcoin futures contract has all other kinds of costs and tracking error and all kinds of other issues associated with making it more expensive for the investor, more of a trading tool right. than a spot Bitcoin ETF, which would be more of an investment tool. Do you have a gut instinct why they went for futures rather than a spot? Well, we can kind of look at what they've said, right? What they've said is that a Bitcoin futures contract itself is a regulated contract um, and a contract that I guess they could get comfortable with because it's overseen by the CFTC, whereas the SEC has said we're not as comfortable with spot Bitcoin because the spot market for Bitcoin isn't as regulated and there may be fraud, there may be manipulation, there may be all these other kinds of things that have given them you know, hesitance about it. And so we took it at Grayscale as a sign that the SEC was actually changing their attitude on Bitcoin when they started approving the first Bitcoin futures ETFs. You thought a spot one would come soon after. We certainly did, because when you think about it, well, a Bitcoin futures contract, where does it get its price from? Where does it get its value from? Mm -hmm. Well, from the underlying spot Bitcoin market. The same way spot Bitcoin would get its pricing from the underlying spot market, right? So you're looking at two alike things. And what ultimately happened is that we got to the end of the application process with the SEC in the summer of 2022. 
They denied our application. Along with countless others? Countless other spot Bitcoin ETF applications have also been denied on the same grounds. And, you know, truthfully, we have now over a million investor accounts that own GBTC, all 50 states, GBTC investors all over the world that are counting on us to do the right thing for them. And so we were really left with no choice but to actually file a lawsuit against the SEC, which we did immediately after the SEC rejection that very same day. And so we're actually suing them now um, in court, um, in the um, you know, appeals court in DC. And um, you know, we believe we could have a decision uh, challenging that SEC denial, uh, hopefully by as, as late as maybe the fall of 2023. So okay, things are year. moving pretty quickly on the court case. So you get a decision, but uh, if it doesn't go your way, can you appeal and the same for them? Do they have a history of appealing themselves? It really depends case by case. Right. If we were to lose the case that we're currently litigating now, yes, we could appeal it. Um, there's a couple of different ways that it could be appealed depending on how the denial of this lawsuit would happen. But ultimately, we could actually even appeal the case to the Supreme Court here in the U.S. Right, okay. Um, and what is the grounds for your litigation? What are you saying? to Are they moving goalposts? They're not making things clear? Well, I'll, I'll keep it as simple as yeah. possible. When you're a federal agency like the SEC and you're looking at two issues that are alike and you treat them disparately, you're actually violating the Administrative Procedures Act. The Administrative Procedures Act really ensures that federal agencies treat alike things alike and that they don't end up showing favoritism or acting arbitrary one way or another. And so really by approving the Bitcoin futures ETFs and not approving GBTC's conversion or any of the other spot Bitcoin ETFs for that matter, the SEC has acted arbitrarily and capriciously. And that's the, the kind of simplest, you know, most, you know, rudimentary element underpinning the SEC lawsuit. Is there any historical precedent of similar lawsuits? I mean, there's certainly APA violations okay. that the SEC has been sued under and, and countless other APA violations in general of, um, you know, companies or, you know, other folks suing federal agencies. Sure. And you said, I just wrote it down, you said you're millions of investors, you want to do the right thing by them. But like, in fairness, it's also a right thing by Grayscale. I mean, if you have, especially for the first ETF, sure, it, it's going to open up a massive new market of investors for you. We absolutely are not going to be shy by saying that we certainly, of course, have a commercial interest. Yeah. We, this is this is not just for investors, right? So th there's a couple of things that I want to hit on here. So number one, because GBTC is trading at a discount to its NAV today. If it were to convert to an ETF, there would no longer be a uh, you know a discount. There'd no longer be a premium. There'd be that arbitrage mechanism embedded. Hence, why me and Danny should buy some. Well, I'm not giving investment advice on this podcast, yeah, but course. you do as you wish. Um, but what does that mean? That means there's actually a couple billion dollars of capital that would immediately go right back into investors' pockets on like an overnight basis because the fund, instead of trading at a discount, would you know, bleed back up to its net asset value. And in this environment where investors are facing inflation and all the other kinds of things, I can't imagine why the SEC wouldn't want to protect investors, return that value to them. Well, that's why I asked you about the account management side of things as well, because my assumption is it's great if you've got some great customers, you've bought you know, tens, hundreds of millions of uh, GBTC, but they're now sitting with a discount and nobody wants to sell the bottom. Yeah, they believe in this long term. And I guess there's some account management in them understanding that you are working for them as well to try and bring an ETF. A hundred percent. And I honestly believe that most of the investors in GBTC have really been those that have that medium to longer term time horizon for their investment. They're not in Bitcoin for the next 10 or 20% move in Bitcoin. They believe it's early days and that they're going to be in this investment for a while. So when we're successful in converting GBTC to an ETF, that value will go back into investors' pockets. We're going to see the opportunity of investing in Bitcoin opened up to a larger audience of investors. We very recently, even just this week, started to see some proposed new guidance from the SEC that actually may restrict certain types of investors, whether they're investing through RIAs or other channels, 
may actually have a harder time holding Bitcoin directly. And that may force them into using a qualified custodian or even a product like GBTC for their Bitcoin exposure. So it's more important than ever that this conversion ultimately goes through. And one of the things that I really wanted to make sure that we talked about today, because this is a podcast about Bitcoin that we don't get to talk about enough, is that sure, we have a commercial interest, sure, this value would return back to investors, but people aren't talking enough about the implications of this lawsuit for Bitcoin itself. Okay. You don't need to be a GBTC holder, past, present, or future, to care about this lawsuit. You need to also be potentially a Bitcoin holder or a digital asset investor. Given where we are in terms of not having enough regulatory clarity around this asset class and Bitcoin in particular, given it's the largest of the assets within the crypto space, the outcome of this lawsuit actually stands to inform potentially some of the posturing that regulators may take towards Bitcoin over the short to medium term. And that's not just here in the U.S. A lot of regulators all around the world are looking to see how U.S. regulators treat Bitcoin and treat Ethereum and, you know, treat all kinds of things within the crypto asset class. And so the outcome of this lawsuit is going to have a direct impact on GBTC, no question about it. But the implications are much further reaching than that. And so I would say that anybody who is broadly involved in the crypto space, you want to see Grayscale win this lawsuit. You want to see GBTC convert to an ETF. You want to see this be a milestone that signals increasing regulatory clarity around this space, and I can't underscore that enough. No, no, I agree. I think we all want to see that. Can I just ask a question on that? Yeah. Would um, allowing redemptions today not do the same thing in terms of getting rid of the discount and premiums now? Not necessarily, right? Because one of the things that we've talked about is that if we are ultimately unsuccessful in challenging all legal options available to us around the lawsuit and around converting GBTC, we would be able to entertain getting approval for a tender offer, right? And the tender offer could help to eliminate some of the discount, but it'd be something that we'd need to work out on a bespoke basis with the SEC to obtain relief from the tender offer rules. What's a tender offer? A tender offer is when shares of a fund like this would be bought back and 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 essentially destroyed or redeemed, right? Okay, it's like a like a like burning a token, right? Sure. Yeah. For so, this so, audience, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, but that would not be an optimal outcome if we ultimately were at the point where we were doing that with the SEC. That would mean the implications of us actually being in those conversations would mean that. The courts weren't persuaded by our arguments of how the SEC acted. It would mean that we had exhausted all of our other legal challenges to fixing this issue. It'd mean that regulators were still shutting the door in our face in terms of continuing to bring crypto into the regulatory perimeter. And it'd mean that we were at a last resort option that was not the optimal outcome for investors. So why could they not be two separate things? Like, why could you not still pursue the lawsuit but also allow redemptions? It's another great question. So the to get relief from the tender offer rules, um, which are not really written for products like GBTC, you know, there's all kinds of stipulations. The price needs to be held consistent for a certain period of time. We would need to work something out bespoke with with the SEC, um, it would be very difficult to continue to, um, you know, be actively litigating against the SEC for their position on this, while also getting them to give us the necessary relief to be able to do something that's bespoke and maybe has never really been done before. Is there also a risk that there's like a reputational risk on the trust itself, like the AUM could drop significantly, less people would be interested in it? No, and and to be clear, keep in mind, when GBTC is an ETF, because it will then have the flexibility to both create more of the ETF and redeem more of the ETF, the AUM is going to fluctuate, not just based on the price of the Bitcoin it holds, but depending on if more shares get created or more shares get redeemed. So just as much as we're excited about the opportunity it opens to more investors, there's also the potential for AUM to shrink as a result of being an ETF. How important is the size of the AUM? Um, Because you mentioned it a couple of times at the start. Yeah, there's a difference between 60 million and 21 billion. It's huge. What what does it mean to, to, to... 
it's huge. I couldn't be prouder of the team. I couldn't be prouder of the work that we've done to build the Grayscale business and to build the AUM of these products and open up the opportunity of crypto to as many investors as possible. Um, but certainly, as you think about you know, the makings of a good ETF, it has to do with size and it has to do with liquidity, right? right? And so the fact that GBTC is as large as it is today and hopefully remains as large, if not larger, based on price appreciation, when it converts, having that, that captive share base to start gives it a massive, massive advantage that most ETFs don't have when they come to market, where they start with no assets, the ETF launches, and then the assets start to build from there. Right. I can't have you here and not ask some stuff about Genesis. But I mean, my main question about Genesis really is that situation must be making your job harder. You know, I'm the CEO of Grayscale, right? I know you're CEO of Grayscale. <laughs> I do, though. But you know, you know, I'm going to ask you about this. Ask away. Um, yeah, listen. I think it's important that you know folks listening, you know, understand the relationships between the various DCG entities, right? So, um, what is this? Explain this so somebody understands the structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Digital Currency Group's a holding company, and that holding company has several operating subsidiaries. Um, not an unusual structure, right? You have Berkshire Hathaway owns Geico and NetJets, LVMH owns, you know, tons of different companies beneath it. And Digital Currency Group owns Coindesk and it owns Grayscale and it owns Genesis and it owns Luno, right? And so um, each of these are independently operating subsidiaries. So Grayscale and each of the other businesses has its own leadership team, its own governance, its own policies and procedures, its own budgets, et cetera. Um, do we, of course, work with one another the way that we also work with other service providers? Absolutely. Um, and so when it comes to Genesis, it is certainly you know, sad to see um, how things played out with Genesis that they ultimately filed for Chapter 11. Mm. Um, importantly, for Grayscale investors and for the Grayscale business, we didn't have operational reliance on Genesis. Um, and so we're not affected, our products are not affected, our investors aren't affected. But of course, there are gonna be people around the crypto ecosystem who did have deposits with Genesis and who were caught up in the chapter 11 in the bankruptcy um, proceedings that they're now going through. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, look, obviously you, as the companies work together, there is a unifying factor, which is Barry Silber. There is the fact that you know Genesis is within uh, chapter 11 and then people people think that Barry should be selling grayscale to try and fund like th these things all happen but you you do get wrapped up in it and I'm just wondering has, does that make your job harder I think what we're trying our best to do is not get distracted um, by honestly the headlines and a lot of the conspiracies that have been kind of thrown out there as a result of recent events. Um, I'll tell you the full resources of my team and my firm are squarely focused on this lawsuit. So, you know, we're here talking in mid-February. Uh, the, the oral arguments for our SEC litigation are March 7th. Um, so that's very rapidly approaching. Um, and so, again, from a fiduciary standpoint, we got too many people counting on us, depending on us, to really get distracted by other things going on with other businesses. So you, you mentioned some of these conspiracies. What are, what are the conspiracies? Oh, Lord, am I really going to give airtime to some of the conspiracies? Well, you, you know, get a chance to put them to bed. You know, uh, you know that, that we had anything to do with FTX or, you know, any of these other, th I mean, we, you know, none of, none of these things are, are, are truths. We didn't have direct dealings with Sam or had anything to do with that. I've um, not even heard that one. Oh, really? <laughs> no. Oh, of course. You know, that that's, of course, the kind of thing that, that we're, of course, responsible for. Um, you know, certain things like... Um, Oh, our our lawsuit against the SEC is all you know for uh, for show and things of that nature. I mean, but, but your your uh, your your I say relationship with the SEC this this has been going on for quite some time. Well, let's actually talk about that because I told you earlier in the show I've been at Grayscale since January of 2014. I've been going to DC actively and persistently for. I don't know, at least since mid-2015, yeah. okay? And so we've been developing this ask for permission, not for forgiveness kind of relationship with them. We've been the good guys. We've been the educators. And so when it actually came time to sitting down as a team and saying, if they deny us, 
Are we going to file a lawsuit? Are we actually going to sue the regulator that oversees our business every day? That wasn't a decision we took lightly. Um, that, I'm sure it was. Uh, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. I'm sure you announced a lawsuit a couple of years ago. We said that one possibility yeah. would be that if we ultimately were denied by the SEC, an option available to us would be to sue. Well, how, well, how long ago was that? Oh. I, th- I feel like it predates all this kind of like bullshit of the last year. Oh, it certainly is something that we we wanted to ensure investors knew was something we were thinking about. Yeah. But to actually take the decision to sue the regulator that oversees our business was a pretty heavy decision to have to make. Um, and probably is one of the most difficult decisions I've had to make as CEO um, because it's a big undertaking and it's me asking for the entire resources of the firm to focus on this one really, really important, almost existential issue. And um, we're confident in where we are with the lawsuit and our arguments and and the legal counsel we've chosen to represent us. But, um, you know, this is not for show. Um, We mean business. We have a lot of investors counting on us. Uh, We want to continue to open up access to Bitcoin. We believe now is probably the most important time to be having that conversation. And um, we're just going to continue to you know, fight for investors. That, that's all we can do. When you have a group that there are certain benefits, my tiny little media group, of which there's a podcast, some films, and a football, football team, uh, Danny and Jeremy here, they work on the podcast, and Tom and Emma work on the football team. I'm the unifying factor of them all. But sometimes when I sell a sponsorship, you end, I end up doing a deal. There's a discount if you do the football club. And, and Are you selling me right now? Well, maybe. Okay. Maybe. I mean, it's, you know, we're top of the league. We're a good team. <laughs> um, but, but there are benefits. Like we've just done a deal. And one of them is like if you take everything, there's a discount. And then I work out which gets each. But there's, that's, a ben- that's one of those benefits of being in a group. And look, Barry's a s- smart guy. I'll say a smart guy. I mean, he's got some difficulties at the moment. But like some people may say not. Um, I've always liked Barry historically, uh, but you know he he owns these businesses. These businesses can grow bigger and better if they have working relationships. Um, one of the big questions that's come out is uh, whether Genesis was offering uncollateralized loans to large investors on the understanding that they would then buy GBTC. Are you aware of this? I am not privy to the loans that are going on or that were going on at Genesis. What I certainly can confirm is that when investors were making investments into Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, um, they were doing it either by investing cash, in which case that cash would go out and buy the right amount of Bitcoin. Sometimes they were investing with Bitcoin um, and that was you know, adding up to a certain number of shares. Or in other instances, they might have been borrowing Bitcoin uh, to be able to add some leverage into the trade that they were doing. And sometimes those loans could have come from Genesis, but they also could have come from loans that they obtained elsewhere. The actual collateral requirements that an investor had to make a borrow is not something that we would know. But you are aware that Genesis customers were buying GBTC? Certainly. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the Genesis business, you know, it was it was and largely still is, you know, the Genesis trading side of things, you know, spot trading, derivatives. I mean, they were a industry stalwart mm. um, that, you know, almost every institutional and in, in high net worth partner was using for some kind of, you know, crypto related service um, as they built out their prime broker offering. Because th- these loans businesses typically they don't tend to do uncollateralized loans because it's such high risk. Sure. Um, and so I- I'm wondering what is the incentive for Genesis to be taking such high risk off- offering uncollateralized loans if it's done on the condition that they can they have to use that to buy GBTC, which kind of becomes a money printer for them to then go out and take other loans. Some somebody has to be incentive. There has to be incentive in there somewhere. So I don't believe the incentives with Genesis. There's certainly a great incentive for G for Grayscale because you sell more of the shares. So I try and understand who is structuring those deals. Is it Barry, and he's instructing people to do this because there has to be some kind of interrelation interrelationship group benefit and therefore interrelation intercompany discussion to make that happen. So 
the Genesis business has and and was an authorized participant for the Grayscale products. Um, today, Grayscale, um, with its own broker dealer, is the authorized participants for its products. It's one of the things we worked on over the last couple of years. And so, like any authorized participant, they're of course going to make a fee when they create shares of a product. It's true of an ETF, and it's certainly true here. But there was no, and and never has been, any kind of arrangement that if you know someone was borrowing, that there would be some kind of other way to incentivize or compensate somebody for making that loan if it was for GBTC or a Grayscale product. So you're saying Genesis weren't offering uncollateralized loans as long as they bought GBTC? I have no idea the collateral requirements that Genesis was asking of somebody if they were borrowing coins for GBTC is what I'm saying. But I mean, you're aware of this now though. I've heard about it and we're talking about it today that that certain people were saying that the collateral requirements were either off market or were, you know, atypical if they knew the proceeds were that. But I am not aware of what the collateral requirements were that somebody um, was dealing with. If they were taking a borrow from Genesis, they were dealing with someone at Genesis, not someone at Grayscale. We don't have a loan book. We don't loan. No, no, I get, right, I get, I get all that. But you know who these customers are. You you know who 3AC are. You know who these people are. And they would have been significant customers of Grayscale. So what kind of due diligence do you perform on these companies when they're making such significant purchases? The absolute largest and most extensive due diligence we can do. AML, KYC, source of funds, government-issued IDs, you know, everything possible. I mean, we're selling a security. These are regulated investment instruments. Um, but the things that you're touching on, which is around collateral requirements and things like that, that is within the scope of an arrangement made between borrower and lender, not between, um, you know, the issuer and the investor. But you you were aware, so yeah, you know, if 3AC are buying a significant amount of GBTC from you guys, you have to perform due diligence on them. They passed all due diligence checks? Due diligence, absolutely. I mean, in terms of AML, KYC, source of funds, you know, coins that are run through, um, you know, chain analysis or whatever the appropriate, um, you know, uh, blockchain forensic tools um, that are that are available now. That That's the kind of work that's done when investors uh, make an investment in a Grayscale product. And so source of funds could have been Genesis. Could, could have been Genesis, yes. So is there not really a conflict of interest of the source of funds? Why would there be a conflict of interest? Because, hmm. Because if, 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 the, if the fund if isn't dirty, it isn't known. I see what you're well, saying. Well, no, I yeah. think here's what you're getting at, which is that if you're hedge fund XYZ, and you want to borrow some Bitcoin to invest in a Grayscale product, well, you can go to Lending Desk 1 or Lending Desk 2. Yeah. And if Lending Desk 2 happens to be Genesis and yeah. they happen to be giving you a better borrow rate than Lending Desk 1, well, then you may want to make that borrow from Lending Desk 2, from Genesis, right? Um, and so there's no conflict of interest there. No, whether, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's up to the investor. I tell you what is it is. I, I tell you what, I find hard to believe. And... I don't expect you to uh, give give me the answer that I I, I think I th I'm wanting here, but I I find it very hard to believe that yeah, there's billions of loans being issued by Genesis, which is then being immediately used to purchase GBTC, and that you wouldn't be aware that this is a relationship and an offer that was made specific. I just find that really hard to believe. Totally separate companies, totally separate businesses. But the unifying factor is Barry. And I would find it very hard to believe that he doesn't talk to both CEOs to discuss this arrangement. I just find it very hard to believe. I mean, it's, you've worked with Barry since 2000, whenever. I mean, it's yeah. market. I just find, Barry I would is, find that very hard to believe. Barry is a visionary. Barry is an incredible investor. Um, Barry is not an operator, right? Barry is not someone that is telling myself and the rest of the Grayscale management team what to do day to day or really any of the operating subsidiaries. Um, that's how and why Barry has amassed for DCG the largest and arguably 
most impressive venture capital portfolio in the crypto space, you know, broadly speaking, right? And so, um, at, to, at what cost to investors? What do you mean? Well, you said he's amassed the most impressive, but at what cost? Yeah, there's lots of people now, whether they're Gemini own customers or Genesis customers, <laughs> who have no access to their funds. DCG made investments in venture capital p companies, um, in, in venture-backed companies, private companies, blockchain companies, crypto companies, in every continent. And you know, I think it's over 200 companies, over 40, 40, um, 40 countries around the world, not using Gemini Earn deposits, um, using proceeds that Barry the businesses made being profitably run businesses and or from the very limited amount of capital that DCG raised um, when DCG formed as a company. That's, that's only part of the story. Do you think it's ethical what's happened to Gemini Earn depositors and uh, Genesis depositors that they now have uh, facing the fact they have no access to their funds this is a range of people that could be massive high net investors down to the little guy. Bear in mind, I've, I've got Gemini as a sponsor. I've read the emails of people who've lost their funds, cannot mm -hmm. access their funds. No, it's exceedingly disheartening. It, um, no, that's not the question I asked. I asked, is it unethical? Is it, what, uh, what part of it is unethical? The Genesis were offering uncollateralized high risk loans, which were used, which have now propped up the AUM of Grayscale. I mean, Genesis putting extending loans that made their way into Grayscale products is one of numerous ways that the Genesis loan book was used. You're avoiding the question, though. I'm saying I'm was, not at all. Was it ethical? I'm trying to ask what is unethical. I think it's unethical to offer loan, and it's a separate business, right? I'm just asking you. Yeah, about so the that's ethics. what I'm saying. You're asking the wrong person. I didn't make the loans. But Grayscale didn't make the loans. But I'm not guilty by association as a result of well, it. Well, you're part of DCG. You're part of the group that allowed this to happen. So you are part of this. You might, you, you may be part of Grayscale, but Grayscale's AUM is propped up by what I would say unethical behavior, potentially fraud. Okay, we, we can argue about whether it's unethical or fraud, but it's certainly unethical what happened because people now do not have access to their funds. The, the loans that were issued, that are uncollateralized, to high-risk firms who didn't have the collateral mm -hmm. and were therefore told if they, uh, they could have these, high, uh, these, these highly valuable loans as long as they buy uh, GBTC, that is unethical. But I would say that's unethical behavior. Would you say that's ethical? I am not aware of someone who said you can have set loan if you do X or if you do Y. Well, I'm aware, so I'm telling you. Do you think it's ethical? Were you one of the people who took the loans? Nope. So then how are you aware? I'm aware. <laughs> I'm just, okay, look, hypothetically speaking. Right, you know, you have to take a giant step back, right? Then you have to look at the Gemini Earn program, right? So Gemini Earn had X number of investors who were depositing to Gemini, click the Earn button to earn yield on their crypto. Yep. Um, I flipped the question back to you. Was it prudent of Gemini to then, as a counterparty, in the early stages of where crypto lending was and still arguably is today, was it prudent of them to put all of their customers' deposits for earning interest to a single counterparty? I mean, I would ask Tyler and Cameron right. themselves if I was with them. Right. But they're not part of DCG. But nonetheless, they're still the ones who extended that that in all into one place, right? And were they doing the proper due diligence on the way that Genesis was or wasn't making loans, right? But that's a question for Tyler and Cameron and Gemini. It's not a question for... Uh, uh, it's not a question for DCG. The question is, you're part of DCG. I'm really responsible for running the Grayscale business, of right? Course, so, of course, but you're part so, of DCG. So I can share in the frustration. I can share in the anger. I can share in the saddened state that we are in because people have been disadvantaged, have had you know millions of dollars of capital that's been tied up in these types of um, arrangements because the Genesis loan book shut down, because Genesis went into chapter 11, but I also can't claim or take responsibility I'm, for it I've running the grayscale you, business, I've right? Not take, I've not asked you to and, take And I also can't really opine in a sincere way whether things were ethical, unethical, untoward, or toward, because I think I'm you have not- a I think, actually think you have a duty to, because 
you've talked early on about the size of the AUM. Yep. We know the fees, the high fees that you guys charge, the 2%, leads to a massive amount of revenue a year for the company. Now, if the AUM has been propped up by unethical uh, uh, behavior by another company within the same group, with specific arrangements that have pushed people towards buying more of this, that have essentially taken the funds of retail and uh, other institutional investors from Gemini Earn and Genesis, and that has pushed up the AUM, the revenue that your company has earned and the wages that pay you has come from unethical behavior, potentially fraud. Your, you, the money you earn has come from that because the AUM you've earned, sorry, the uh, commissions on the AUM you earn comes from the money of Gemini customers and Genesis customers. That's a mischaracterization. I mean, it just isn't. It's, I mean, it's factually true. It, it absolutely is a mischaracterization. You cannot extrapolate an arrangement that was made between Gemini and Genesis um, to deal between the two of them and the resulting losses that have come from that arrangement being something that we at Grayscale are somehow responsible for. It's, it's just, a, it's a bridge too far. I, I didn't say you were responsible for. Or, or, that, or that our, what did you say? Our wages are, are earned unethically? I said... How do you feel about the ethics of this? How do you feel about the ethics? You're part of the same group. You are part of DCG. DCG is run by Barry, who runs most, most of these companies. There are intercompany relationships. Part of your AUM has come from the misappropriation of Gemini earned customers' funds and the misappropriation of Genesis customer funds. That money has gone into Grayscale and bought Grayscale shares. Therefore, the money you make on top from your commission has come from that. So these people who do not have access to their funds, mm -hmm. they've lost money because of the unethical, potentially fraudulent behavior of Genesis. How you can, how you can not take any, how, you can, how that can't affect you is beyond me. Of course it affects me. How but could is it, it ethical what happened? It's not a question of ethics, though. Okay, then is, was it fraud? It's not a question of fraud. I can't be responsible and I'm not responsible for what has taken place at Genesis. Any of the customers who became Grayscale clients as a result of taking a loan from Genesis, if those clients are no longer actively in business or have shut down their fund or whatever it may be, has a result of their misappropriation, of their risk management, of their counterparties, of the investments they made. And I'm sure that investing in a Grayscale product or taking a Genesis loan or whatever counterparty exposure they may have had may be one of a multitude of factors that ultimately led to their demise. So to take it as far as everything that's now transpiring between Genesis and Gemini is not something that- And Grace Grayscale. We're not party to this. They're, okay, uh, let me put it a different way. What you know and what you're willing to say you know are probably two very different things. They're I'm not. I'm in the tooth. You have, a, you have a PR person with you. This is a PR tour. You've got rehearsed lines. I, look, I get it. I, I, I don't. We're having a conversation. No, 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 I get, no I get it. I just- I, I, I reckon there is a difference between what you know and what you're willing to say you know. I, but what I would say is any, P, any <laughs> I, PR I, you I, have will not save your soul from what's happened to all these people. There are people, I've received their emails, they're heartbreaking. I can't imagine how heartbreaking they are. And some of their money is now in the Grayscale Trust. Their money was as I understand the way that Gemini Earn and Genesis worked, was that when you clicked an earn button I'm in talking Gemini- about Genesis loans that were uncollateralized as well. We can't just all, always flip this, uh, flip this back to Gemini. I'm not. So you're trying to tell me that you think that somebody er lent money from Gemini to Genesis and Genesis lent it into a Grayscale product? I'm telling you large loans that were offered uncollateralized went towards buying grayscale shares and then those grayscale shares grayscale shares were then used to post as collateral elsewhere but how are you trying to say that somebody's gemini earned deposit made its way into a grayscale product because those funds were stored with genesis and then genesis used those as part of their assets under management and they used those to loan out so genesis had an active loan book 
some deposits they took from Gemini, some deposits they took from other people, some credit they extended back to other people, some credit they did to other people. But somehow, because they had an arrangement with Gemini and, I don't know, hundreds of other counterparties to loan and borrow yeah, from. It's very complicated, I'm sure. Well, they did. They were the largest loan book in the crypto space, and right? And all these things, that very complicated. The tentacles go ev everywhere. Right. But so, Gem Genesis is intrinsically linked to Grayscale. Intrinsically linked through being in the group, through Barry, through the arrangements that were offered to people who offered large uncollateralized loans. Those large uncollateralized loans ended up in the Grayscale Trust. Therefore, the AUM you have and the interest being earned has come from that unethical behavior. Okay, well, I'll tell you again what I said earlier, which is that I am and we are at Grayscale not aware of special arrangements that were given to customers that borrowed from Genesis that were using those borrows to invest in Grayscale products. The terms that Genesis offered to their counterparties was terms that were offered between Genesis and that counterparty. Grayscale is not in the lending business. We didn't give them special compensation for making those loans or anything of the sort. I don't believe you. I just have to be honest, I don't believe you. Are you, you. looking at the whites of my eyes? I don't believe you. Okay. And the, I don't believe you at all. And I knew there's no, I know there's no chance you're gonna come here and admit it. I just wanted to see you say it, but I don't believe you. You know, we're sitting here on a lovely Friday afternoon having a beer. You've asked me a ton of questions. I have given you an honest and wholesome answer to every single thing you've asked of me. Um, so I'm disappointed to hear that you don't believe me. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I don't. Because do you know what? I, I, I just don't, be, like you've talked about how much, you've, you, you've been at the company more longer than anyone else. You are essentially the number one employee. You've been the managing director, you've been the CEO, you've worked with Barry for over a decade. You know this business better than anyone else. You said you know the customers, you understand the sales, you understand the account management. Even the largest customers will still have a relationship with you. You also had said you have intercompany relationships. You know the CEOs of the other companies, but you didn't know this. So if you didn't know this, I would say either you're lying or you're incompetent, but you should have known. Wow. I, I just feel like you should. If you're the CEO of this company and you have interrelationships with companies like Genesis, you should know this. And because of this, there's been very severe consequences for a range of people. People's lives have been destroyed. So you sound like you're on a little bit of a fishing expedition. I again reiterate to you, um, everything I've shared with you is wholesome and truthful. Um, and again, I'm disappointed that my answers are, aren't satisfactory to you. Yeah, well, we're, we're not here to be used as a, a PR tour. This isn't a PR tour. We're just two guys having a conversation about Bitcoin on a Friday afternoon. I mean, look, I hope your SEC lawsuit is successful. I really do. But I've always been truthful with people when I do this podcast. And somebody knew what was up. And, and, and this, will, this will come out in the courts itself. I mean, you may yourself face questioning yourself, face litigation yourself. Barry almost certainly will. And this will come out eventually, I'm sure of it. But I just don't believe you. And I'm really sorry. I don't mean to be a dick. I think it's better to tell you I don't believe you. Because if you did know, and you can do something about this, that's what I hope you do. I hope, hope from this, you would go and do something about it. I have been working tirelessly to do what's right by investors. We operate with the- Which investors? Grayscale investors. And we have built an organization that is prides itself on doing what is right by investors, acting ethically, acting compliantly. Um, and we will, again, continue to fight for our investors. That's what we're doing by suing our regulator that oversees every aspect of our business. Well, I'll finish on one final point. You, you uh, had a rallying cry for Bitcoiners, why Bitcoiners should care about this, why they should care about this lawsuit. Did that resonate with you? It did, but I would put it back to you that what's happened to Genesis customers and Gemini customers should be equally important to you. And you're part of DCG, you work with Barry. Whatever happened, however it happened, it was unethical and it's destroyed some people's lives. 
And I think you are somebody who can make a difference here. I don't know what you knew. Or you're never going to admit it, but I think you have a duty to become part of something that fixes that for those people who've lost their money. Otherwise, why should anyone give a fuck about your lawsuit? We are... Because the lawsuit isn't about your investors. It's about your company. It's about access to wider <laughs> liquidity. Of course it is. Okay, you know what? I would ask you to do this. For your next 10, 20, 100 podcasts, find another person in crypto who reputationally, who professionally is bold enough to sue the harshest and most hard-hitting regulator in the world. and Dude, you should live in New York City. No, 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 no. Find you, someone else in crypto that is bold enough, that wants to do the right thing enough, that they're going to devote all of their energies, all of their time, all of everything their business is doing to suing the regulator that oversees every element of their business. But that's, you're not going to you're not going to find one. That's not bravery. That's business. You're spending funds on litigation. I've been involved in litigation, personal litigation. Bravery is what I've seen when I've been to the border. Peter, of the every board. other person who approaches this regulator ends up being the recipient of enforcement actions, fines, penalties. You name it. It's not and bravery. Bravery. I didn't say bravery. Bold, say, brave, like whatever the terms. Like, but Peter, we run a regulated business. We've always run a regulated business from day one. They oversee every element of the business. We file ten Ks. We file ten Qs. We file eight Ks. Every element of our business ends up getting disclosed to the investing public. We worked proactively with these people to develop full and fair disclosures for investors. Because it's good for your business. Let's not because it's good, it's good. It's good for our business. Yes, and it's good for investors as a byproduct. And, it, and it's good for the asset class. And yes, we are going to succeed in this lawsuit. And yes, to the point I made earlier, succeeding in this lawsuit is a good thing for Bitcoin. And that is what folks should know. I, I think an ETF would be good for Bitcoin. I, I agree with that, and I wish you the best on the lawsuit. I really do. I think we could leave it at that. Awesome. Good to chat. Good to chat.